Okay, let's get going. So, uh, we're going to, today we're going to wrap up uh, with the data warehousing and related uh, topics portion of uh, the class uh, with a subject that is near and dear to many database uh, people's hearts, uh, something called column stores. Uh, the book also does not do a, a particularly amazing job, or any job, of uh, discussing this, so there's a couple of supplemental readings. Uh, Wikipedia actually has a really nice article on this, um, but the general concept is actually really straightforward, so hopefully you'll all leave the class today with a, a solid understanding of, of what a column store is. Um, a quick apology, uh, turns out my grading script had a bug in it. Um, everyone's projects will be getting regraded, and in particular the ISAM tree, uh, your grade should be going up a little bit uh, based on that. So uh, just to recap, anyone who has scheduled a meeting to discuss project two, uh, please hold off until the regrade. Okay, so uh, where, where do column stores come in? Well. The main motivation that at least I've heard uh, given for column stores is uh, is essentially tied to Moore's law, which I'm sure a small viewer might not familiar with. Uh, processor speeds double every roughly two years or so. Uh, now the the thing with Moore's law is that while the processor speeds have gotten progressively faster, it's actually a optimization of the law, but basically that uh, while processor speeds have gotten faster and processors have gotten uh, much more capable, uh, the other components of the memory hierarchy, uh, most notably disks, uh, but also even just RAM, haven't really managed to keep pace with, uh, with the speed of the processors. And so as a consequence, uh, any time we need to do I.O., any time we need to load data in from, uh, from disk to memory, or even from memory to uh, RAM, this, uh, we want to avoid that as much as possible. And there are a number of cases where it's reasonable, uh, where it's reasonable to even trade off uh, CPU costs. Basically, give yourself more processing work, uh, but in exchange, uh, reduce the amount of I.O. that you need to do. And uh, so column stores are, are basically, uh, one of the main advantages of column stores is that they allow us to make this trade off, uh, doing more computation uh, in exchange for better I.O. characteristics. So how, how, do, how exactly do we store, um, how exactly do we improve the I.O. in general? Well, uh, one simple strategy that we've already discussed pretty extensively is that we can sort the data. If you sort the data, you can use binary searches and very quickly get at the data that you're looking for. Uh, but if you're storing all of your data uh, as tuples, you can really only uh, sort them on a single column. Um, second strategy might be to compress your data. If you uh, gzip your entire database, it's going to take up a lot less space. You can load that all into memory much faster. Uh, but that makes it really hard to access uh, individual fields. So, uh, for example, let's say I'm scanning, uh, I have a, a, a uh, as you'll see in a moment, a, a four-column table, a four column table, and I want to get the third column of every single uh, row. Uh, this is extremely hard to do if the data is compressed. Yes? Can we sort the data on more than one column? Sir? Sorting on more than one column is possible? Well, you can, you can sort on one column and then do a subsort. So if the first column is, for terms where the first column is equal, you can sort, of sort the other column. Uh, that's reasonable to do, um, but that doesn't, ex that doesn't really help you if you're trying to do a range scan on the second column. Do the index for every column. That's another strategy. Uh, but even in the case of an index, you still need to access all of the index pages. And um, if you're doing an index scan, you might need to do a random, uh, a lot of random accesses to get uh, the pages that the index maps to. Um, but you're right, and that that is one strategy we've talked about thus far. Um, and, and it's a strategy that column stores are going to take to sort of an extreme. Uh, right. So the, the sort of core insight, the, the core idea behind column stores is that you don't necessarily, 
the strategy that they use to reduce I/O is that in general you don't actually you don't necessarily need all of the data, um, and I'll get into what I mean uh, by that in just a couple of slides. So uh, first off, let's say we have our fun little table here, um, and we want to store it. In a typical database, a typical row-oriented database, uh, the data would be partitioned into rows. We have a bunch of rows, and if we want to store them on disk, we just uh, append one record to the end of the, uh, the previous record. So basically this forms one big uh, stripe. Now this is fine, uh, but it also means that every single time we want to, let's say, uh, if, if we want to find uh, the ranks of all of the officers, it means we need to go through uh, the entire record. Uh, if we don't care that this officer's name is James T. Kirk, uh, we still need to read those two fields before we can access the rank. So the idea of a column store is sort of to, to rotate the partitioning here. Uh, rather than storing every single uh, tuple at, altogether, you split each column and store the entire column together. Now, in this particular representation, uh, the columns are, each row is identified by a particular uh, identifier. So row ID 1 corresponds to James D. Kirk, and uh, the particular fields of that are going to be um, stored in this columnar fashion. Now you can do, this opens up a whole bunch of uh, different uh, methodologies for uh, storing your data in, in more effective ways. So for example, you can resort all of your data uh, based on uh, the, the data values for each column. So if I wanted to alphabetize the last name and first name, uh, store the rank column in descending order, and store the ship IDs in ascending order, I can do that. And that allows us to do a couple of uh, nifty things. Uh, so for example, if we want to query a column store, uh, let's say I want to find all of the ships uh, for officers who have rank four. And this more or less boils down to this query plan. In order, in order to evaluate that selection predicate, I don't need to see the entire table. I don't care about the first name, last name, or even the ship. All I really care about is the rank. And because the data is sorted, I can do a quick binary search uh, to find all of the tuples that satisfy the particular predicate. So in this case, I'm looking for all tuples uh, where the rank is four. I can find that very quickly. Now, rather than storing the entire tuple, I'm going to store just the row ID. So when I pass the output of this selection predicate to its next stage, I'm not going to pass it full tuples. I'm just going to pass it a set of row IDs. Of course, that means when I'm actually producing output, I actually need uh, to do something uh, more intelligent. I might need to scan over uh, the table, uh, the ship column uh, to find all of the, the uh, so I know that the that rows one and five are part of the answer. I'm interested in only the ship column, so I need to go over this entire table. I need to find rows one and five. But this only needs to happen once for each query, and if you store these, uh, one simple strategy that you can use is to store two copies of every single column, one sorted on uh, row ID and one sorted on uh, the actual data value. So if I want to go from uh, row ID to data value and it's already sorted, I just need to find entries one and five. That's pretty easy. Any questions so far? Okay, for the most part, column stores are not, uh, not especially crazy. Okay, now let's say, Let's say we want to do something a little more interesting. We want to find uh, the first name of all officers uh, who are on the enterprise and have a rank greater than or equal to 3.5. Now each column is stored separately, so I need to do these, these two queries uh, independently. Now that actually 
leads to a very nice uh, benefit for parallelism because I can do both of these selection predicates entirely in parallel. Uh, but that also leaves me with a bit of a problem because now I have uh, two output sets. What do I need to do? Yes. So I need to take the, those results and I need to combine them back together uh, by doing a join. Or uh, more generally, I need to do a sort of set intersection between the row, uh, set intersection uh, between the row IDs that satisfy the predicates. Uh, so I know that rows 1, 2, 3, and 4 satisfy the predicate on ship, and I know that rows 1, 5, and 2 uh, satisfy the constraint on rank. And so I just find the intersection of those two, which is rows 1 and 2. Um, yeah, that's basically uh, all there is to column stores, uh, the, or at least the from a 50,000 foot view. Uh, this is pretty much the core concept. Uh, store data in columns, and that allows you to do, uh, store data in columns, and that allows you to do a lot of sort of weird tricks with how you perform your, your predicates. It also, however, allows you to do uh, some interesting things with data storage. So for example, you'll note here that Row, uh, that there are two separate rows uh, with a rank of four, two separate rows with a rank of three, and in fact, four separate rows uh, belonging to the ship 1701A. Um, what we can do is uh, called run length encoding. So we can take this really, really ginormous table and we can identify sequences, especially if the, the, the table is sorted, we can identify sequences or runs of the same value and merge them together. Really, no, no questions on this so far? Okay. Where do they store those uh, counts? The counts? Yeah. So basically the same thing uh, that you would do with the row IDs, or more precisely, because you, you still need the row IDs in this case, uh, so rather than counts, you're just going to store the mapping from uh, from value to the set of row IDs that correspond to that value. Okay, wow, we got through that a lot faster than I expected. Um, there's one more thing I want to talk about, uh, but just to sort of wrap up with the, the column stores concept, uh, the basic idea of a column store is you just store things based on columns. Uh, this representation allows us to be a lot more uh, I.O. efficient because, well, first off, we don't need to read entire rows. And that's just extremely critical for applications like uh, computational, uh, computational advertising or uh, big data analytics, where you have literally huge numbers of rows. Uh, so uh, Facebook, Google, Yahoo, all of these guys, Microsoft, uh, will basically have these huge tables of extremely wide, like hundreds, possibly even thousands of columns wide uh, for every single person that they've identified. And each of these, usually they'll, they'll want to do certain selection predicates, they'll only care about maybe uh, a dozen or so of those hundred or thousand uh, columns. And if we're only looking at 10% of the columns, we can cut our I.O. rate by 10% by just reading the individual columns. Uh, it also means that we have the flexibility to organize each column uh, separately because well, each column is being stored entirely separately. So we can sort, we can do all sorts of uh, crazy stuff. And it also means that we can use some uh, nifty compression techniques to uh, streamline the storage process. Uh, if the row can, if the row, every row can, if one page, if one column, You'll still have, um, I'm not saying that this gets rid of I.O. entirely, I'm just saying that this makes the I.O. much more, uh, much more efficient. Because the, so, if you have, um, or you, you have a row, and you want to tell them my page. So, let's say you have a million rows, and in, you're not going to fit a million rows into, into individual pages. Uh, but let's say you're only interested in 10% of the columns of the entire table. Then, uh, and let's say there's 100, uh, 100 columns. That means you're doing basically you're reading 100 million values. However big those values are, you're reading 100 million values. 
If you're only interested in 10 of those values, you only need 10 of them to, to perform your query, uh, you can just as easily read 10 million values, save yourself an order of magnitude in terms of uh, the I.O. required. Does that address your concern? Any other questions? Yes. Does it have a name? Is that what they're saying? Why isn't it implemented as a So, uh, yes. There are a couple of disadvantages. So first off, um, the major, major, major disadvantage is the fact that in order to get back the row, you need to perform a join. Um, in order to do a two-way join, for example, you'd essentially need, that would essentially blow up into a four-way join uh, because you have the two columns between the two relations that are being joined, and then you have whatever, uh, sorry, you're doing R join S join T, and these are separate attributes that you're joining on. Uh, then, in addition to doing this, now you also you turn this three-way join into a four-way join. R dot A join S dot A uh, on A. So you have one one table for each attribute. Uh, so this would be the attribute. The attribute table for R, the attribute, uh, sorry, for A and R, the attribute table for A and S, then join on S dot row ID with S, S, T, join T. Uh, so you essentially introduced an additional layer of complexity in here. Um, the other thing, uh, so the other penalty is if you do actually want the entire tuple, now you actually have to perform an n-way join to merge that tuple back together. Uh, so essentially you're, you're giving up a, a substantial amount of CPU uh, performance. Uh, also the compressed, uh, if you're compressing the data, um, there are a couple of more intricate compression strategies. Uh, essentially, running something along the lines of gzip, gzip on the on the entire stream. Um, if you're doing that, then there's also uh, the overhead of actually decompressing all of that data. You're saving your uh, you're saving IOs, but before you can actually use that data, you first need to decompress it. So, I mean, it's it's not uh, the there are trade-offs, you're, you're, and there's a whole, a whole mess of, of um, database systems that will live somewhere in between. Uh, so there's one called uh, CStore, which I believe became Vertica, uh, and that allows you to store essentially subsets of columns, any subsets of columns. Uh, right. Yes. Three ways, right? Two ways into it by three ways. Yeah. So uh, the uh, you are just selecting the columns which are actually of use in the way. So it is not that that efficiently and uh, it's still a performance hit. I mean, it's, whether or not it is enough of a performance hit that it's no longer worth it, that that depends on the application. So if you have, uh, I mean, it depend, the, the main thing it depends on is how much of, um, how big the intersection is, uh, how, what fraction of uh, S you're actually querying there. So if S is a two-way relation, you're not saving yourself a huge amount uh, by, by, if, if S has two attributes, has only two attributes, you're not saving yourself a lot by uh, partitioning it. Uh, so the main places that column stores tend to be used are, are these applications where there are huge numbers of columns. Um, like I said, uh, computational advertising, big data analytics, uh, science, uh, a lot of sci uh, scientific computing applications. Um, this occurs very frequently. Okay. Um, all right. So one other thing that column stores enable, or one, 
one other sort of idea that has been uh, built on top of column stores. This is actually fairly recent, uh, last five years. Uh, it's this idea called uh, database cracking. Um, starting to see a couple of uh, database systems implement this. So uh, recall when, when we started talking about data warehousing, um, one of the first things I said, one of the, the, the sort of biggest challenges is this extract, transform, and load phase, uh, where you actually load the data into the data warehouse. And this is an extremely, extremely expensive uh, process. In particular, the load phase, uh, because you need to do things like sort the data, you need to build indices over it. Uh, you need to basically take all of the, that data and organize it. And the problem is that all of this has to happen before you can do any queries on the data warehouse. Um, this is this is this has to be done before you can do anything else. So, what database cracking tries to do is ever, uh, spread the cost of uh, of loading the data, spread the cost of organizing the data uh, over the course of, of query processing. So immediately, uh, so the idea is basically to load the data in immediately. And as you query the data, use the, 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 the process of querying the data to, to build up a repository of information to, to organize the data in some meaningful way. This is actually, again, uh, despite the, the sort of crazy terminology, this is actually uh, very simple. So a quick show of hands, who's familiar with quicksort? Just the general principle. Okay, so this is essentially quicksort broken down into lots of lots of tiny chunks. So let's say we're doing a selection predicate on, uh, we have a selection predicate on this data set. And in particular, we're looking for all of these uh, where all values uh, greater than 42. Now we can do this without any sort of index, without any sort of um, organizational structure on here. We're reduced to doing a full scan over the entire data. And well, that's pretty expensive, uh, especially if this is in fact a couple of petabytes of, of data. But what we can do is, as we're scanning through that data, we can do essentially uh, one step of a quick sort. So uh, what does quick sort do? Yep, so it's gonna, we're gonna pick a partition value and then we're gonna split the data based on that partition value. So in this case, we're gonna choose the partition value uh, to be 42. And then we're going to perform uh, basically just one step of quick sort using that uh, value as a, a pivot. Every time we encounter a value greater than that pivot, swap it with whatever is at the end and ri rinse and repeat. And eventually we'll go through the entire list, we'll find all of the tuples greater than 42, <coughs> and we can return them. That's easy. Um, and we store a pointer to that point in the list where, uh, where the split has occurred. So now we know, uh, for future reference, every time we want to access uh, something that's greater than 42, uh, we look in this set. Every time we want to access something that's less than 42, we access that set. But note that the, the data has not been fully sorted. So uh, data here is out of order, data there is out of order. But it's it's been properly partitioned. Do the sort take place in loading or not while loading. This is while the query is running. So we're going to do sorry when the query is running. Yes. So you will take an end and step big end step. Uh, so normally, in order to answer the query, we need and uh, we need to do a full scan of the data. So what's the difference? Ah, because now the data is partially sorted. So we, we've, we've paid the cost of, of running the query over the entire data set, but now we've, in addition to gaining the answer to the query, we've also gained something useful. Now we know that everything below this point is greater than 42. So we have a back of that, uh, right? Yes, so now this has been partially, it, it's been, uh, part, uh, I'm gonna say partitioned, but essentially yes, it's uh, partially sorted. So now, we get another query, another query comes in, uh, and we're, at, we're looking for all values less than 17. 
Now normally, we'd have to, if the data wasn't organized, we'd have to go over the entire list from beginning to end, uh, an order n operation. Uh, but we know that everything, uh, everything beyond this point is greater than 42. So when we want to uh, answer the query about 17, all we have to do is scan up to this point. And on, on average, that's going to be about half the data set for the second query. Um, so we do the same thing, and once again, we scan up to that point, and we partition the data. So now we have uh, a set of values that are less than 17, a set of values that are greater than 17. And every single time a new query comes in, we're going to do exactly the same thing. We're going to find the partition where um, th we're going to find the the, um, the the partition where that query would live, or the set of partitions, and we're going to return uh, return all of the values that are definitively in the partition. So let's say we, we now get a, a request for all values greater than uh, twelve. So we know all that. We know that this partition fully satisfies that, because this is between values between 17 and 42. We know this partition fully satisfies that, because it's values greater than 42. Uh, so we can just return these as is. We don't need to do any sort of scanning, any sort of anything intelligent whatsoever. Uh, then all we need to do is, is right here, uh, just make sure that those are sorted. Sorry? Every time the queries have the pivot values. Yes, so we're going to keep an index. Uh, we're going to keep the pivot value. And in fact, uh, in fact, we're actually going to use those to start building an index over the, uh, over the relation. So once the data is sorted, can we remove this index? Um, yeah, I, I mean, the, the index still helps. Uh, it still helps because it's um, you're not guaranteed that the data is uniformly distributed, and if the data isn't uniformly distributed, then um, binary search doesn't necessarily perform all that well. The index doesn't hurt. I'll, I'll put it that way. And it can, um, whether you keep it or not, whether you even build it in the first place is is arbitrary, but it it helps. Uh, the other advantage is that it uh, helps. Well, actually, we'll get to that in one more slide. Um, right. So um, basically, the idea is to, to just start with with a completely unsorted blob of data, and then as as you perform your queries, uh, try and leech off some of the work that you're doing with that query in order to uh, partition the data properly. Um, one trivial optimization is that the first time uh, you, you perform the query, you actually copy the data. So rather than uh, rather than sorting in place, uh, you're gonna you're gonna scan the data and then uh, put the sorted version into a new in an entirely new copy. Um, the advantage of that is that we now have two copies of the data: one that is being progressively uh, sorted based on value, and one that's already sorted based on row ID. What's a copy? Of the entire relation. So um, this entire thing would get duplicated. Uh, and keep in mind that in a column store, you're not just storing these individual values, you're also storing the row IDs. So you have one copy that's stored sorted based on the row IDs, so you can very quickly access the value for a particular row ID and you have one uh, copy that's sorted based on uh, value, so you can get the, the row IDs for a particular value. Uh, between building uh, B plus tree? Yeah, I gave So in order to build a B plus tree, the entire data needs to be sorted beforehand. Or you can, sorry, you can, you can insert values into the B plus tree. You're not necessarily guaranteed that it will produce a, a particularly well balanced B plus tree. Is this value available in the circles? Is that a type of in the circles? I don't know if it's a B plus tree. 
So, uh, so what I've described so far doesn't handle insertions at all. Um, but that is actually a good question and brings me to the last bullet point of, of the slide. How do you handle insertions in this case? Thoughts? Uh, you mean after, sorry, uh, uh, go ahead. I mean, after the, uh, uh, the initial data is loaded, uh, we have to insert something. I'm asking you to add a So let's say we're at this point. Uh, we, are, we have all of this data, and now we get 10 more data values. Or, let's keep it simple. We get four more data values. You can just use those uh, partition indexes and then insert. Okay. 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 Is there a downside to doing that? Yeah, if they insert, I mean, if they manage to insert it as well, then we have to scan here and. So, um. Like the 10 things that's okay. So, as we're doing those insertions, um. As we're doing those insertions, we're modifying this entire relation, right? Are we, can we do any sort of queries while those insertions are happening? So let's say we have a, a five petabyte database and we're inserting another gigabyte of data. So once again, so basically we end up blocking while that insertion is happening. So we're, we're essentially sort of off Offsetting the, the initial cost. Um, so I said, uh, you, you do this because you want to, you don't want that high upfront cost. Uh, you want to be able to sort of spread that out over, over the cost of, of running queries. Um, can we do something similar with insertions? Well, so let's say we do, uh, we insert. To use this example, let's say we insert four, about four new values. Could we, let's say we insert four new values. Um, as we're running the query, or what, what do we need to change about the, the query processing in order to um, account for that? Did you? Okay, yeah. So you, you keep a separate list of everything that you've inserted, or even just append it to the end here, and say that, that range is unsorted. And then whenever you do your, your normal query scan, um, you also scan that list and uh, sort accordingly while you're doing the query, partition it accordingly while you're doing the query. So, uh, well, just as a place to store it, you can keep it in a separate file. You don't necessarily need to keep it at the end of the list. I ignore what I said about putting it at the end of the list. You just need to store it some. You, you need to store it someplace. Where that is is irrelevant. Okay, well, um... So, uh, after they have appended the newly arrived data, so just uh, due to the already existing thing, mm -hmm. uh, uh, now suppose the query is done, then uh, our indexes are built over the, uh, the older table, right? So, and we don't, uh, we haven't uh, built indexes on the newly arrived data, so how will it restructure itself? You know. I see. So um, there are there are a couple of strategies. Um, the simplest one is to do the insertions in uh, basically do the insertions as you said, but do them while you're while you're querying the data. So basically, pick out the ranges that are relevant to you and um, build the insertions as you as you go along. Um, but then it could be very inefficient. I mean, if the data is as you said. Well, that's already in between. 
you only need to uh, to handle the, the fraction of the, the data that the query would actually ask for. Yeah. So if the, the data is only asking for tuples in a very fixed range, you insert those. And again, the, the overall goal here is to, um, you're, you're increasing the cost of running a query. Not by much, necessarily, but you're increasing the cost of running queries, uh, but you're able to get answers much faster uh, with, because you don't need to wait for the entire thing to be uh, indexed, sorted, and uh, stored on the disconnect reasonably. <laughs> Uh, you just have some data that isn't that is in the table, and when you ask, I mean, it's the same way you have uh, the same thing that happens in a normal database. You have data that gets inserted into a table. You ask a question about it, and the, the question has to be answered. All right, well, um, we will resume on Monday with, um, I believe next up on the list is normal forms and other forms of formalization.